made a very useful uh, program for people who've been listening. We hope this will open some uh, uh, avenue of discussion and dialogue. Uh, and we hope that you'll ring in again. Uh, we don't ho obviously hope to uh, antagonize or to uh, insult anybody. Uh, all the references that were given by the brother over the last three weeks uh, have been from the Atlas and uh, books that he's researched over 15 to 20 years of his life uh, whilst he's been on this uh, uh, journey to the truth. Uh, one last word, uh, a prayer. Um, I pray that, Ya Allah, please let us live our lives following the truth and those who are with the truth. And let us follow their traditions and gather us with them. For your prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family, said, man is placed together with those whom he loves. And some don't care. Um, in Islam, we are encouraged to seek the truth uh, rather than live our lives uh, through blind faith. And the people that uh, I've met, including uh, Naim al-Malik, have uh, been on this journey of truth. Uh, a journey which is uh, fraught with problems, social problems, when you have pressure from family, from friends who think they know the truth and who want to guide you away from it. Um, there are all sorts of other problems such as uh, lack of guidance, uh, whether it's because you don't speak a particular language or whether there's a lack of literature, etc. Yet, uh, having gone through all these problems, uh, you know, Naim and my other guests uh, have been through uh, one journey which has uh, brought them here to the door of the Al Bayt al Islam. Now, what I'd like to do first of all is just to ask uh, if you could just summarize what we've been talking about because the viewers have joined us um, who may not have seen our other programs. Bismillah rahman rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Um, Ijaz, when uh, one starts talking, as, as we said before, I think very early on in the program, what we were discussing here today is the history of Islam in a very, very confined way. We are trying to find the truth of Islam, what the Holy Prophet has taught us. Okay? When we analyze the writers of history who have written these books, who have left these legacies, whether they're writers of Hadith, whether they are uh, interpreters of the Quran, mm -hmm. we can't dismiss them what they have written. Because when we do the research of oneself to find where we are walking on this earth, what is my goal? Because the main goal in this life is, why am I here? Yeah. Who am I going back to? Because Allah has sent us here to gather the knowledge, to build the ilm up, and then to go back with him perfected in our deen. Right? So the knowledge that I'm talking about and the knowledge that I've discussed uh, and I will discuss further on are from the books that have been written in history by all scholars. So I'm not confining myself purely on the thought of one ideology. Right? We are looking at uh, a broad spectrum of religion, whether it be in Buddhism, whether it be in Christianity, mm -hmm. whether it be in Judaism, whether it be in Islam itself. Now, the four schools of thought that Islam has are not uh, bound to be followed as must, you know, because the Holy Prophet did not come to us and tell us that I'm leaving you four schools behind. He came into this world, he professed a religion, and it is the truth of that religion that we are looking for. Right. Now, the four schools actually come into this category of anal analysis. Um, but last week and the week before that we discussed that, first of all, the house of the Prophet has been purified. We discussed what the house of the Prophet was. Okay. Today and um, consequently onwards, we'll be looking at how the companions of the Holy Prophet are looking at the house of the Prophet and looking at basically his, his daughter, his wives, uh, his children, right, and his etiquette. Now, when I say the house of the Prophet, our brothers in the Ahl Sunnah will naturally assume just the women. I'm not just talking about the Holy Prophet's wives. In fact, I'm far from it. I'm talking about the Holy Prophet's house and the five purified ones. I'm talking about uh, his grandchildren. I'm talking about his daughter. I'm talking about his cousin. And I'm talking about his uncles. Okay? Those are the people that I'm most concerned with uh, who are very close to the Holy Prophet, who the Holy Prophet said are my uh, pins in the ground, are my vicegerents. These are the ones who are charged after me 
to protect the deen and to carry the deen forward. Okay. Now, <coughs> during your research, one of the, uh, like anything, you've got to set a certain methodology. Mm -hmm. um, um, am I right in saying that one of the main conditions that you used was that you uh, that whatever you uh, followed would be uh, according to the Quran and the, and the teachings of the Sunnah of the Prophet? Uh, the Quran, I mean, the Holy Prophet said this verse clearly that uh, if my hadith does not match, i.e., my sayings, my actions mm. do not match the Quran, then throw those actions whoever brings them to you. Okay. When we hear the Holy Prophet saying that, that if the actions don't match the Quran, throw the actions out. Whether the actions are reported by, um, shall we say, even the Ahl al -Bet, if it does not match the Quran, now the Holy Prophet household would never attribute something to the Lord Prophet that does not match the Quran because he's the walking example of the Quran. But there are millions and millions and millions of hadiths, right, which we all say are correct. And the way all of the Muslims decipher them, they all have to be correct, weak, or uh, correct. You know, in, 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 in weakness, correct as well. Right? So if they're slightly weak, they can still be correct. Right? If they are uh, so, so weak, but there is some truth in it. Mm. Right? But the Holy Prophet said clearly, if they do not <coughs> match the Quran, then throw them out. But we have forgotten in history to throw things out. We keep accumulating them. Right? And we don't match them with the Quran. We don't match them with the holy actions of the Holy Prophet himself. Mm. Right? And one of the things is how the Muslims treated the Holy Prophet himself first and then his household. We are talking about on those issues where the Holy Prophet, how the companions with him were treating him and the Quran is testifying to how the companions are with you, Holy Prophet. Okay. As far as uh, your early uh, teachings were concerned before you started on this road to uh, research. What was your views on the companions, for example? You know, we get not your views rather, but but we are taught. Yes, we are taught that not to question the companions in any format, right? If they've seen the Holy Prophet with their eyes, and mm. uh, they're not to be questioned. Now, I can understand that to a point, but. It is not part of our deen to believe in their testimony. Because the testimony of Islam, the profession of Islam, is done by the Holy Prophet. So if we are told not to question people who are outside Islam, i.e. the companions, mm. they are not bringing the religion into, into play. Right? The Holy Prophet is building them. But we can't even analyze their character. And in, 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 this is how I was taught how to believe, that we can't analyze the character, we can't analyze their crimes, we can't analyze their uh, idiosyncrasies, they can't analyze their personalities. Right? As long as they've seen the Holy Prophet, they're all going to paradise. That in itself set alarm bells in my head. Right. because regardless, regardless of whether they contradicted the Holy Prophet's teachings or not, you would regardless. Regardless, right. because they, they pull out these wonderful, uh, what do you call, hadiths to back that up, okay. right? And what did they back it up with? They back it up with, the Holy Prophet said that the stars and the companions are like the stars. When one falls, another one rises, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, well, if these stars are so great, then why are they cursing each other? If these stars are so great, why are they fighting amongst each other? If these stars are so great, why are they fighting the house of the Prophet? If these stars are so great, why are they avoiding the issue of commandment from the Holy Prophet? Mm. And as in the previous, ish in the previous programs, we've discussed this, right, on, on history of Islam and also the Treaty of Hudabiyah, how many people disobeyed the Holy Prophet? And, and so many times over here, people disobeying the Holy Prophet. And the Quran testifies to this, those who disobey the Holy Prophet, those who raise their voice to the Holy Prophet, have got to be uh, admonished. Because the Quran is admonishing them. Mm. You know, and we're not to take the testimony easily. Okay. So when we issue such an edict that you know, all the companions are equal, all the companions are just, and those even who commit crimes. And as we said last week, we discussed about one of the fantastic statements of uh, Muawiyah bin Sufyan. Uh, against the, the Amir al Muminin, against the Khalifa of the time, when he actually said that um, he was going to rise up an army in Safin. And then we hear the Sunnis, uh, the Ahl Sunnah especially, uh, with a statement of Hadith saying that Imam Ali was the rightful Khalifa, but Muawiyah bin Sufyan got it wrong. And he got uh, one thanks for it, Imam Ali was going to get two thanks for it. Well, I ask you self, I mean, I ask you to ask yourself really a question like this. If Allah has forbidden you something, 
if Allah is forbidding you from something, right, how can you get thanks for something that is forbidden to you? Okay, if you're committing a crime, you're getting admonished from Allah, you will not get payment from Allah. Mm. Right? But we put on these rose tinted glasses and we come out with these wonderful statements of hadiths, which have been written, by the way, hundreds of years after the Holy Prophet's death and nobody analyzes these. So when we start beginning the analysis and we see how much of destruction, how much of uh, deviancy is in these hadiths, we have to expunge the hadith out and take the hadith as not compliant with Islam. Because to destroy hadith that is not compliant is not uh, going to be punishable to us. Because we are looking for purity, we're looking for truth, we're looking for the way to go to Allah when we present ourselves. Mm -hmm to have followed the Prophet's commandments and the progeny of the Prophet correctly. Okay. Yeah. So as far as acceptance of hadith is concerned, it has to follow uh, the teaching of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and the Quran. Yes, and, and the Ahlul Bayt. And the Ahlul Bayt. Because we, we cannot distinguish now just the Quran, the Sunnah, and the Holy Prophet. Because, well, let's come back to the Sunnah. Uh, this is a very, very fascinating thing. that. I want to actually put a question to our audience, you know, if a person like the Holy Prophet is teaching something in the house, then how is it that the person outside has more knowledge what he has taught in the house? I mean, if you look at the example today, if I said to Brother Ijaz, I hear you're getting your uh, bathroom uh, redecorated, mm -hmm. right? You and your wife and your close relatives who sit with you who are in your house all the time would know what's happening in your house or would it be me who's asking you the question what's happening in your house and you told me you're redecorating so there is a big issue here at the moment mm -hmm. right that the people in the house know exactly what you're doing in the house right but you've just told me that I'm having this done I cannot be an authority on your house here we have the same issue we're getting the hadiths written on some of the hadiths are so so fascinating we, we have to find where is the truth in this hadith Right, um, and I want to put some fictitious hadiths. I point out some fictitious hadiths, right, which are which don't make any sense, you know. And people, our alims and our um, highest learners who spend their life in deciphering hadith, the Quran. There is a fantastic hadith which, which to me, even today now, it bamboozles me. It makes me laugh. Yeah, and I think it'll make you laugh as well when I quote it to you. Okay. Let me just quote it to you. It says to you that if this hadith is reported very famously. If you do not wake up for your Fajr Salah, mm -hmm. right, and you don't wake up for your Fajr um, uh, duties, and the, and the night, Shaitan has urinated in your ear. You must have heard this. Yeah. Yeah. What I want to know is, if you went in wudu in sleep, okay, uh, all your night, was in wudu and you were purified because Allah's ibadat is in sleeping because it says to you when you're sleeping it's Allah's ibadat mm. right how is it that shaitan is urinating in your ear and what condition are you in who is reporting this who has seen shaitan do this and where is it coming from again we are logical people we are sensible people we are not here from uh, fictitious uh, uh, superstitious right uh, we have to look at this deen in a category that we're looking at is analysis. Mm. You know, all subjects are open to analysis. Mm. And how these analyses are done are done with logic, with reasoning, with akal. You know, and the Quran is the reference point for us. But when we ask these people where do these fabricated things come from, we find that they come from inherited cultures, from inherited ideologies, from inherited own visions, right, and own aspirations. Mm. Yeah. But those are not part of deen. You know, they are taken away us away from the deen so so fast and so so quickly that within superstition and fact the idea is lost you know we start losing the deen the fabric of that deen right okay. within this 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 ideology that is pulling us and today the whole battle the whole of the battle of the uh, Muslim Ummah is they are fighting to change our ideology they want us to get away from the truth. They want to take away the Quran from us. They want to take away the truth of the Quran from us. They want to keep away the Ahlul Bayt from us. If you actually follow some of these ideologies and you see what they are saying, 
you see the illogical views they have, the illogical ideologies they have, the, some of the superstitious beliefs they have. In that, and when you sit down and, and look at yourself and say, well, am I, am I part of, of this belief? Or am I in the belief of the Holy Prophet, which the Quran is quite logical, the Quran says ponder on items, the Quran says use your akal, right? And Quran says to you, Allah says to you directly, I cannot put a burden on you that you cannot carry. I do not give you commandments and duties that you cannot carry, right? And then we've got these superstitious ideas, we've got these fabricated ideas that we are one of those creations, that this can happen to us, that can happen to us, right? And it's from hadiths. So we have to analyze the Quran you know, more stringently and what the verses of the Quran are, what the tafsir of the Quran is, what the Quran is trying to direct us towards, and what the Quran is moving us towards. Mm -hmm. Because in the end times, when you're finished in the grave, when you're lying in the grave, you will not be questioned on hadith. Because hadith is not going to be one of the questioning issues. The question is going to be is whether the Quran was your book. And you know, when you see these words, is the Quran your book or is the Quran your reference? If you've taken it as a reference above everything else, then you are safe. But if you've taken it as a reference below, and Hadith and the Sunnah and everything else as above, then you are mistaken in that sense. So hence, I want to go further into the exploration of what the companions did with uh, the house of the Prophet. Okay. And when we look at the lady of the time, the Holy Prophet's daughter, uh, Bibi Fatima alayhi salam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The Prophet, by the way, when Lady Fatima used to come into the house or when he attended her, the Holy Prophet used to stand up for this particular lady. It shows me how the Holy Prophet has put preference over the duty of loving her. And throughout his life, he showed um, his relationship and how his ummat, yeah. his, the uh, people who are following him, yeah. should treat yeah. her and what you know, there is a, they should there have. Is, there is such a fantastic saying of the Holy Prophet. He said, mm -hmm. he who angers Fatima angers me. He who angers me angers Allah. You know, that in a nutshell, this is from his own mouth. Mm. And this is written by all of our scholars. Okay. Right, that this particular issue. Where did you find that? What sort of books is that written? In? <coughs> this is written in you know um, in Sahih Bukhari and Muslims and Muslims of all these people. But today I'm not going to go into those. What what the Holy Prophet said. But I want to see how the Holy Companions of the Holy Prophet. Okay. Right. They are holy because they've seen the Holy Prophet with their eyes, so they're regarded as holy. But what I want to ask the audience to do is here, yeah, is you decide for yourself whether they are worthy of that rank that you give them. Because Islam says to you that you can only rise in the eyes of Allah, right, with your piety and your taqwa, right, not because of your proximity to the Holy Prophet, not because you saw him with your eyes. It is what you did, you know, in your actions to his house, to the deen, how you profess the deen, how you carry the deen forward. Um, this is, they said, yes, we heard it from the messenger, right, uh, therefore I testify before Allah, the angels, that you have angered me. This is we talked about Fatima, uh, the Holy Prophet, when she was speaking to Abu Bakr and uh, Khalifa Umar, mm. right? Uh, she asked these two people about Fadak. Let me elaborate on Fadak. What is Fadak? It was a garden given to the daughter of the Prophet by the Holy Prophet in his lifetime. Right. It was gifted to her uh, as booty from the Holy Prophet. When the Holy Prophet died, um, this particular issue, Bibi Fatima came and she requested that this be given to her and her children and the first two Khalifas refused so that this was, the Prophet did not leave any uh, kind of testament for that to be left to her. Okay, and they argued with this. And Lady Fatima at this time said clearly, did you not hear the Holy Prophet said what I just said, that who angers me angers the Holy Prophet, who angers the Holy Prophet angers Allah. Hmm. They said, yes, we've heard that. Now, the two Khalifas had heard that, but they're still willing not to give the right that was hers to her. There's another question, right? Right. I mean, if there were you, witnesses to, to this gift. This witness, there are hundreds of witnesses to this gift, right? right? And this booty. I mean, give an example to you, the Battle of Khaybar. When Imam Ali fought in this, bet, in this battle, the people, the historians write that on, on particular this issue, that the booty from this battle, right, filled their stomachs for years to come, 
right? And the gold in their house after the battle was for years to come. Yet, we don't see any of this booty in the house of the Prophet. We see it in the companions. You know, he gave it to the companions. He told them to enjoy the booty because of the, the, the win on, in, in that particular battle. This is the only gift that we are looking at that the Holy Prophet bequeathed in his lifetime. And he did it whilst he was still alive. Whilst he's walking the earth, whilst he's, he's actually present on the earth, whilst his companions are watching, he had given this to uh, his daughter. Okay. Right. What the lady of the time was wanting was full control of it in her house. Okay. And this request, the control of, was put in such a way that prophets don't leave anything behind for their offspring. Right, that was the excuse that was used. This is the excuse and this is the argument used against the lady of the time. Right. Now, if that is the case, then all the prophets who left legacies behind, all the prophets who left gifts behind, even the first Khalifa and the second Khalifa left and bequeathed things behind for their um, people to inherit, right? We are talking about an inheritance that is not inheritance, that is a gift that is rightfully the ladies. Mm. Okay, it was given to her in the time, so it is not the prophets anymore. It is the lady of the times' gift. It is her gift. All she wants is basically, yeah, to take control of it, of her right, of her right, and exercise her right. Yeah, and this right, at the moment, is being usurped. Okay, by the people. Now, historians write that when she asked for this, she was very eloquent. The way she came forward, the way she put herself forward, the way she argued her case, the way she stood in the mosque, the way, she was very, very polite. She was so eloquent that people mistook her for the Holy Prophet speaking, you know, when, when she stood there. But the way the situation turned was that she was told that this is not her right. But she says to Imam Ali, bury me at night and don't mark my graves. There are two issues here. First, bury me so that those who are, who are her enemies, and she's made them enemies, and she's called them enemies, right? Don't attend my funeral, right? And secondly, don't mark the grave so they know where I am buried. Up to this today, up to today, up to now, we can go to Medina, we cannot find her grave. We find the Holy Prophet's progeny, we find Imam Hassan, we find Imam Jafar al-Salak, we find all of the Prophet's aunts and all of the Prophet's uncles. Why don't we find where his daughter is buried? It is a contentious issue. It's a very, very big issue in Islam, you know, that we need to find, first of all, what the problem was, you know, before we can correct this problem. But in Tariq al she did. she died and she asked to be buried, buried secretly, okay, in the book called Tariq al she asked for this issue. My problem here is when I read this book and I see what I am uh, interested in is why has her anger continued, okay? Because if this was just a visual uh, reference of something not being given to her and she's, she didn't think it's important, mm -hmm. right, she would not be this angry. But I'll tell you what it is, it's, if we remember that time, and if you see that time's poverty, we are talking about the household being fed by this garden, her children being fed by this garden, right? Holy Prophet already took care of this, that after my death, my daughter will be fed from this garden, which is all our right. We want to our daughters, our sons, to inherit something, right, after our death. But the Holy Prophet bequeathed this at the beginning, that's something that uh, has been used, uh, I mean, uh, from my uh, learnings that um, some have said that it was a, a small issue to the point where f uh, the Garden of Fidduq was brought down to a petty level. Um, it wasn't a petty level, was this it? This is not a petty level. If it was a petty level, the lady in question would not make an issue of it. Exactly. Okay. She would not put seven or eight veils on her body. You know, the Holy Prophet's daughters stand in the world as such. Nobody saw her head, nobody saw her face, nobody saw her feet. Why would she put seven veils, right, onto her head and then walk to the mosque demanding a right? Okay. Uh, regarding the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his pure family, and his guidance and hadiths, which showed the relationship between himself and his al-bayt and between his al and the rest of the Ummah. 
We'd come to the topic of his daughter, Jinnab uh, Fatma Tazara, and uh, the way he showed how she should be treated and the way she was treated after his passing from this world. What we see <coughs> when the Holy Prophet stands up for his daughter, he's actually showing the people around him, look how important I am basing my love for her. Okay. This base of this love is ingrained in the Holy Prophet to show the Ummah, right, that his love for his house, and also with the verse of the Quran says, I ask nothing from you for myself, only the love of the Ahlul Bayt. Bayt. Right? Now, this Ahlul Bayt, that is the house of the Prophet, in Hadith Akissa, in, in Taqlain, we see all this. Who are these Ahlul Bayt? And historians and writers of all books have said, well, it's all of the house of the Prophet, including his wives. It's funny that uh, when uh, this particular revelation came to the Prophet and uh, this, this, this purified verse of the purification of the five and the Holy Prophet's wife, Um Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, she asked the Holy Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, am I one of those in the purified? And the Prophet said to her, the words are very clear, no, Um Salama, you are perfect where you are. All right? So the Holy Prophet is actually excluding the wives. Mm and he's actually including uh, the five uh, which are in his house, which is Imam Hassan, Imam Hussain, uh, Lady Fatima, and Ali ibn Abu Talib, and Allah himself. Allah. Now, I think when people see in the houses of the Shia this wonderful five-handed, um, and I've heard so many people <coughs> say, what is that hand, what's all that about? You know, uh, the five fingers are actually the five purified people of the Holy Prophet's household. Okay. And the purification verse which says, which says in the Quran and Surah Nisa is that Holy Prophet, Ya Allah, Ya Allah says to Holy Prophet, Holy Prophet, we want to keep away uncleanliness from your house, impurity from your house. Right. I think we have a caller on the line. Um, hello? Hello. Hello. Can I have your name and can you tell us where you're calling from? Uh, my name is Hussain. Okay. Um, you know what uh, the gentleman is uh, giving all the references about uh, Bhagir Siddhak and this and that. That's right. That is the one side of the story. Okay. But if you have got uh, uh, the other side, uh, then the story will be a little different. Right. Understand? So this, is, this way, when one gentleman is putting question that uh, she demanded for Bhagir Siddhar, but the, what happened after that, he is not telling you. Okay. Hello? So you're saying that, uh, uh, that uh, Naeem is, has taken a one-sided view uh, from the research he's done uh, from yeah. the Hadiths? You see, what uh, he is talking about Asaba Ikram, Asaba Ikram that uh, spend most of the time with Nabi Akareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. Right? Their name is mentioned in Quran as well. Understand? Where in the So, Quran? to deny Can the Quran... Right. Could you just, you see, could you just answer names uh, question? Where in the Quran is it mentioned? In so many places. So many places. Can That's you why I ask you... Right, okay. You are, could you give us an instance? this kind of statements on, on the TV, you should have uh, the other side as well. Right, okay, that's that what we're asking you for. The confusion is, 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 is cleared. Okay, that's this what we're asking way, you for. Could, you know, you made a statement that have, uh, the uh, companions... corrupting people, understand? Uh, more, more and more uh, confusing coming to, into no. Ummah. Right, I don't think there's any confusion. We're right. having a dialogue and yeah, you've rang us. Yeah, could, could... Right, I think the caller is... The gentleman asked the question that we are showing a one-sided view of Islam and that is on my side being a Shia. But I think he's only seen this program maybe this time, but I have mentioned I'm coming from the Ahlul Sunnah. I have understood the books of the Ahlul Sunnah right. and I'm coming from that faith myself. But he mentioned something that the companion's name being mentioned in the Quran, right? 
there is not a single name of the companion that is mentioned in the Quran. If he has that name, the caller, please give me the ayah, give me the Quran, whose name is being mentioned and whose action is being mentioned because the Quran is replete with revelation, right, of the Holy Prophet's household. It has got no mention of any of the Holy Prophet's companions. Yeah. The only place I can see where the Holy Prophet's companions are mentioned are in Surat Abasa and the actions they're doing in Surat Abasa. Mm -hmm. right? That is not based on the Prophet's personality. It is based on a personality that is next to the Prophet. Okay? But even then, that person's name is not being mentioned. So the gentleman in question who's questioning me obviously is ignorant of the Quran itself because he said the holy companions are mentioned in the Quran. Well, my friend, the holy companions are not mentioned in the Quran because if it was so, we would know every one of them by name. Okay. Anyway, let's digress from this. And obviously I'd like to mention that if uh, the caller would like to ring back, you know, with those references, if he has them, uh, you know, we'd like to hear the other side of the story. Um, you know, we have a fantastic ignorant, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, structure that if we cannot uh, argue or debate or discuss on a level of intellectuality, let's go into fiction and name throwing, right? But unfortunately, on this program, uh, if you're going to throw a name, we will want references, as we have given references from the Quran and from the Hadith. But that's, what that's what I mentioned right at the beginning of the program, that uh, anything that is mentioned by yourself, yeah. you've given references, yeah. it's not your personal view, no. you've researched uh, into, uh, you know, you came from the Al Sunnah, yeah. uh, you spent uh, quite a number of years sure. researching this, to bring yourself uh, to the conviction of faith, yeah. uh, you know, rather than blind faith. Sure, but the also, gentleman also said that I'm giving a one view um, dimension of mm. this image. Well, if it's one view, he should be glad because of all the books I've quoted are from the Ahl Sunnah. You know, they're all from Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, uh, Ibn Thumiyyah, right? So why are you complaining about your own books? Okay, because this is how ludicrous it is. Mm. These books that I've mentioned are from all the books of the Ahl Sunnah. I've not mentioned a single book here, right, which is just basically, purely based on our ideology. I've not even come to that. But disregarding that, anyway, uh, we have the enemies of the Holy Prophet. Uh, who want to tarnish his house and want to uplift the companions as the gentleman said on TV just now that the companions are meant I think we have another caller <coughs> You have a caller on the line? Hello, yes. Yeah. Hello, can you give us your name and where are you calling from? Hello, let me my name, Mirana. My name is Dr. Gilani, so I'm speaking from Glasgow. Hello, Dr. Gilani. Can I have your question? Hello. No, I think I'm, I'm phoning in response to the gentleman caller who called uh, a short while ago okay. uh, about the uh, verses in Quran about the Holy Companion. Okay. But what I would really like to point out is there are 150 verses in Quran about the Munafikeen, and some of them are stars, uh, oh, you believers. So there were plenty of hypocrites among the companions. Okay. So I think to balance the things out, that, that side of the equation has to be taken into account as well. There were, of course, some of them were very, very good, of course, but, but, but there were all kinds. So I think I would just like to put my viewpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gilani. Uh, very useful comments there. That Thank you, Doctor, because I think she listened to, we discussed earlier, when we started this conversation, I said to you before that the, 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 the Quran separates these people into kuffar, munafakin, yeah, mushrakin. Okay? So the Quran is quite clear in categorizing the people. But I have chosen to highlight the people that the Quran is exposing in a specific way. I'm not here to judge what they did. I'm actually pointing out what they have done is not Islamic, okay? It's not in concordance with Islam's teachings. And what the Holy Prophet is requested from us to do and to follow is follow the path of purity, the path of his house that has been purified, and the vice parents that have been left behind for us to follow as an example are free from this impurity. Because if you look at the first institution of Islam, the Holy Prophet, he has to be infallible. If the Holy Prophet is not infallible, I will not follow that Prophet. Because the Prophet of Islam and all Prophets, not just the Holy Prophet, Khatam al Anbiya, the Holy Prophet is a seal of Prophets. He has to come from a pure, pure source, from a pure lineage, right? He himself has got to be free from sin to be a Prophet. 
Because a prophet is not a person who is speaking of the future. He's not somebody who's professing the future. He is the voice of the creator when we walk. This is what prophethood is, right? But if we attribute that whoever he speaks to is automatically purified, then we've got a problem because the Quran says clearly, O oh prophet of a oh whole prophet, right? That amongst you are companions that are munafik. Okay, we have to look at the Quran openly and in an analytical way. We, if we just accept the hadith, sunnah, hadith, sunnah, that all of these people are perfect, they can't commit a crime, and they've been uplifted, no, I'm afraid that's not true. Because Islam and, doesn't allow us to do that. And you hit it on the head there, that you have to look at everything openly. Yes. Uh, analytically. Yes. Without any subjectivity yes. involved. Neither you, neither I, neither any other human being yeah. brought this uh, deen to us. Yes. The deen was uh, brought to us by the Holy Prophet. See, sitting here today him. on TV and going across these cameras and this the studio, my, my vision is not to convince anybody what I'm saying is the truth. I'm asking you, go read these books. Go analyze these books. Go match it with the Quran. Make your own decision. I'm not sitting here to tell you to become a Muslim of this kind or a Muslim of that kind. I'm asking you, look at the criminals of Islam. Look at the enemies of Islam. Look at the people who profess true Islam. Look at the people who purified Islam. Look at the people who carry Islam. Look at the people who Allah says are on Sirat al-Mustaqim and who Allah says are truly worthy of being led, being, making you leaders of. Right. That's all I'm asking you to do. Mm. Find the leaders, because in the verses of the Quran, the Quran says, find a route to me, a purified route to me. Why is the Quran asking you to find a purified? Is he just doing salah and zakat and Ramadan? No, it's much more than that, because the niyat of Islam and the niyat intentions that we do are part of the deen. But to purify oneself, to walk on Sirat al-Mustaqim, it takes a much, much more longer effort and time. You know, but we have to have the right teacher because, again, it comes to teaching. If we get the wrong teacher or if we get a false teacher, then our, our uh, uh, knowledge will be disrupted. Our knowledge will be encrypted right, in their encryptions, right, which will be hidden with the ideology. Hence, we see today Islam in many guises. We see Islam in many forms. Right? But what we try to find here today is an Islam that has been professed by the Holy Prophet in such a way that we do not we do not deviate ourselves. Mm. We do not go from the pure teaching of Islam of the Holy Prophet. Now the Holy Prophet has set standards. And he, I clearly stated at the beginning of this uh, program, right, that if the action does not match the Quran, do not follow the action. That's, okay. that's a condition you used in your research? Yes. And, that's and all my life I've sat and opened the books up. Okay. If it does not match the Quran, right, I will not accept that, whether to please a nation, whether to please a people, whether to please a clan, whether to please your heritage, I will not please you. I'm here to please Allah, and I'm here to follow the right conditioning that the Holy Prophet brought for his nation. Excellent. Okay. I mean, the whole purpose of being a Muslim is for the pleasure of Allah, doing whatever Absolutely. pleases him. Absolutely. Because you are in love with him. He is in love with you. You love who you please. Yeah. He pleases us, we please him, right? He has given us authority over animals because he loves us. He has given domain to us above uh, all other creatures on this earth, right? What do we do in return? We sit back and just enjoy it without thanking him, right? Do we sit back without acknowledging him? Do we sit back and do not know what the conditions are to become truthful in, in, in the path that we're walking? No, it's not. Because the Holy Prophet and 125,000 prophets came to guide us to the same word. And you know, the same word is believe in the oneness, monotheism. Monotheism is the only, I think Islam, this Islam is the only religion in the world today, right? And I can clearly state that. It is the only religion in them with true monotheism. But if we start bringing our own ideology from other aspects of culture, heritage, added into this deen, we are destroying this deen from that point of view of perfection or purity. And we want to find that purity, really. We do not want to go to this deviancy of having accepted heritage, uh, cultural values, right, cultural associations. This has got nothing to do with deen. Okay. Yeah. I hope uh, we've made a very useful uh, program for people who've been listening. We hope this will open some uh, uh, avenue of discussion and dialogue. Uh, and we hope that you'll ring in again. 
Uh, we don't ho obviously hope to uh, antagonize or to uh, insult anybody. Uh, all the references that were given by the brother over the last three weeks uh, have been from the Atlas and uh, books that he's researched over 15 to 20 years of his life uh, whilst he's been on this uh, uh, journey to the truth. Uh, one last word, uh, a prayer. Um, I pray that, Ya Allah, please let us live our lives following the truth and those who are with the truth. And let us follow their traditions and gather us with them. For your Prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family, said, Man is placed together with those whom he loves. Allah Hafiz.